uh, Luddite qualities as a woodworker here? Um, so you should go on the um, near your leave button. There should be a white box with an arrow in it, up in it. Near my uh, so on the top where it has things like or, or wherever things that says over participants and chat and and things yep. like that it's nearby Maybe your meeting. Yeah, that's it. If you click share content and then you can either click on share screen, which will do your whole screen or window if you're doing just the PowerPoint. So, let me try it's looking good. Yes, yeah, the whole screen. And then Are you seeing that PowerPoint? Uh, not the PowerPoint yet, it's just the screen. There might just be a bit of a delay. Mm. If you try stop sharing and then sharing again, perhaps. Um, if people could turn off their cameras as well, actually, because sometimes that helps with speed if we're having a bit of a, a slow speed. So there should be a, a little camera button and a microphone button. If we turn those off, that might help with speed. Lovely. Yeah, that's looking good. We can see that PowerPoint. Can see that PowerPoint. OK, yeah. and then if I'm. Are you seeing that PowerPoint as full screen? Uh, not yet. We're just seeing the the normal screen. Uh, oh, it's okay. oh, there we we're, we're getting there now. Okay, and now I can see it. I think there might just be a little bit of a delay on it, but it should be good. Right. In that case, I will now um, hand over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, sorry, <laughs> everyone, if, especially if you've been waiting for your uh, delays. Um. I'll get straight into it. Um, hopefully this uh, talk gives you some benefit on what I do day to day uh, and without knowing quite who the people watching are, uh, it'll be geared towards uh, people with an interest in historic buildings or homeowners uh, or just people of Wisbeach who are uh, interested in these things. Um, I'll just do a very brief introduction to sort of historic building types and then look into um, the different approaches that we might take with um, historic woodwork and um, a couple of practical steps um, involving a few of those things. Got a few pictures of some of my portfolio um, which will hopefully prompt some questions and I'll try and leave lots of time for a question and answer so that we can um, give direct feedback to the people actually watching and, uh, and hopefully um, we'll have some interesting things to talk about just prompted by the pictures that we see. So um, it's quite interesting for me to be invited uh, to this talk. Uh, my partner and I, my partner works in stained glass conservation. Uh, we were both hoping to come down and do a practical uh, demonstration with Wisp Beach Heritage, um, but that's not going to happen, but it's lovely to be able to do it as a talk. Um, and it's interesting to just consider what type of historic buildings are out there and the reasons that certain areas get conservation status so sort of draw attention to this language of vernacular building and and then the sort of the classical styles so in bold I've, I've kind of highlighted the Georgian I think that's the majority of where the Wisbeach uh, kind of heritage tradition is uh, although there'll be some other examples in the in the local area and there always are and it's quite interesting to to see what it is that people value and and hold as important so um i've popped modern at the bottom there with a question mark as well because there's always a bit of a barrier for the age at which we consider things important and it it often ends up being a few hundred years ago or at the very least your parents were uncool and your your grandparents stuff was quite cool so anything that gets older than that tends to be tends to be precious and uh, cared about but it's interesting to consider what what might be being built today that might also be worth preserving so um I've just pop that in there so that we don't don't take it for granted um vernacular is quite a quite a funny word it's certainly used by architects and people interested in uh, architectural history um I've quoted a few times Brunskill, who's a, a sort of 
leading light on uh, writings on on that style. So the the distinction that will draw between the vernacular and the the classical is uh, is highlighted by a couple of these quotes here. So vernacular will draw more towards the traditions of an area of the people and of the materials available within an area. So um, the skill sets that are that abound, maybe you're more likely to have brick in areas where clay is predominant and you're more likely to have stone traditions in areas where the geographical landscape lends itself to easier quarrying. So um, this applies to really historical buildings, but obviously even to the Romans, the, the transport of materials and design history meant that uh, methods and uh, ways of working have moved across across Europe and further. Um, so we see different things in different places. Um, I highlighted that nice phrase, regional personality, and I think that's that's a good one to draw upon when looking at vernacular buildings. Um, and then just that that third point there, are just some of his more lyrical language. I think it um, it prompts us to think quite interestingly about whether we as people in Britain or, or further afield can identify some of the some of the vernaculars uh, just by just by language or by how it evokes thoughts in us. So uh, certainly for me, um, maybe a West Country twang comes through in my accent, but soft honey coloured stone is very resonant of of the Cotswolds and, and things on that uh, soft stone belt of the country and my time working in in Scotland would you know, uh, draw attention to some of the examples of heather thatch that exist um, so it's interesting it, even on a traditional material that we might consider of the being the same everywhere something like thatch is actually very regional to whether it's the reeds bed reed beds or the straw or the heather uh, means of working and Whilst that applies to other materials, it's um, it's obviously got some resonance for for timber as well. So, um, hopefully, some of those prompt prompt some ideas of where you might be in the country as you, as you read those uh, read those quotes. Um, and what's lovely about Brunskill is, apart from being well travelled, he's he's happily brought up this picture on the, on page thirty eight. So, um, hopefully, more familiar to to some of you watching than it is to me, but uh, we'll make it there one day. Um, and this is a picture of the North Brink in Wisbeach, so one of the areas that's been identified um, for interest by the conservation area reports and overlooking the river. And that's that's hugely significant to why would the developments of, of this settlement be uh, hinting at a more international classical tradition and obviously the the means of travel being being offered by boat means that uh, there's there's a lot more opportunity to explore different historical types of buildings. So um, and we've also got the river there. That's my my grandmother was uh, was settled in Northamptonshire, so I'd consider it the Nen, but I'm I'm assured it's the Neen for the the people of Cambridgeshire. So um, hopefully we'll. So leading more towards what we could see in that image, the 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 frontage of the, that those riverside properties on the the North Brink may be taking um, some classical inspiration. Um, certain things that would crop up regularly in in how we look at classical buildings. Um, probably the the quote that's highlighted at the bottom, graciously proportioned classical. So things that um, hint towards symmetry or repetitive patterns, um, standardisation of measurement sizes. Uh, the, the sash windows that kind of abound in that image are hinting at the types of things that you'd have seen in uh, well-to-do towns and cities across Europe at a, a similar time period. So I've got a quote from George Samurai Smith at the top there and he is a is a classical architect working in a sort of new classical tradition, uh, often for Adam architecture. But that's a, a quote from his sketchbook, and, and he 
is a happy worker in the classical tradition. Sometimes architects, uh, architects and planners can can have fights amongst each other uh, and see it as a battle between modern and, and classical. But um, but lots of lots of modern architects will take similar similar inspirations from from their travels and from from the patterns and uh, architecture that they see abroad. So just to reiterate that distinction of vernacular being closer to a local material or works, workmanship style and classical maybe being more influenced by uh, styles from far flung places, as we see in that image. Um, and then drawing it back to Wisbeach and um, I've enjoyed reading the, the conservation report there um, or the area appraisal from 2016. And obviously we're a few years beyond that now, um, looking at the things that might be might be cared for and might be important, um, not exclusively, of course, like beyond maybe 0.5 on the general character there, sort of hints that we're all drawn to, to big churches and areas of special interest and the things that maybe have already been best preserved, but um, small scale retail and residential focus is actually very important for the overall uh, feeling of an area and how we look at it from a conservation and preservation uh, perspective. So that general condition report ranging from good to derelict is quite right, wide ranging and I think I draw attention to that final final line there, neglect and lack of maintenance is a problem. So that's um, that's pretty much universal, but it's also probably the most important thing we can consider. So how do we uh, work together as a community and bring in interested parties to to reverse neglect in uh, in people's attitudes, but also in how we work on those buildings and then maintenance as our first port of call for how we can look after our historic buildings. Um, so these were two of the other quotes in uh, that report. There's it's probably worth a read, maybe <laughs> maybe the authors and maybe people who are already interested are actually listening here to this report, but um, I've taken just some of the lines out of it to, to draw attention to what we might be looking at in this area and we're looking at the 18th and 19th century classical Georgian frontages to buildings um, elegant sash windows sort of uh, that, that and ostensibly symmetrical that, that's all mirroring the language of classical uh, building but I've also highlighted local brown brick I think that's interesting to take that timeline where although things were borrowing from other areas and there was a lot of shared building styles and aspiration to look like the merchant cities um, there was still an appreciation and probably just an economic necessity to use what was nearby so a local brown brick is a consequence of using local clay and um, and using the the brick makers that would already have been um, up and running in the area. So that's uh, that's clearly representative of the brick style in the area. Um, and in the second quote, I just highlighted the local brown brick appears again. And then as we read these reports, we're always sort of drawn to those things that we're not that familiar with. And for me, it was highlighting the uh, Galt clay. So uh, that takes me on my first first little tangent. I just thought I'd draw draw attention to these sorts of pictures and um, just to quote from Wikipedia, sometimes the most reliable source, sometimes not. Um, but just a lovely uh, geological image there as well. So thinking about the the manner in which our geography and geology kind of determines how we how we build and what might seem quite far apart in parts of the country uh, can actually sit along a, a long seam of um, underground material that ends up actually drawing communities from opposite sides of the country uh, to have quite similar vernaculars and sometimes they use the same materials and take it in a very different way but um, the gold clay that I was unfamiliar with is stated there part of the upper green sand formation so it's sort of runs just past the the 
Cambridge area there, which uh, obviously makes it a local material. Um, and more on kind of classical word speech and just out of context quotes from the uh, from the area appraisal. Um, but a little bit starting to draw us towards my area of speciality, which is, is timber. Um, so elegant sash windows um, for those who work with historic buildings. This is one of the most common sort of repeating themes of um, sliding sash windows. It's a lovely character feature of traditional properties, um, both um, high value and and also more more common properties from a certain era started to see that as a as a standard method of working a functioning sash window is a lovely thing it lets in a lot of light it frames the view very nicely um, and when they're double hung that is the the top and the bottom casement both slide um, it's actually an incredibly practical window design for allowing ventilation in your property so one of the distinctions between traditional buildings and and modern building standards would be that ventilation would have been very much part of the whole building design so when we're looking after older buildings we need to be quite careful about not sealing up the building in the same way that um, a modern building style that can be excellent like the passive house would seek to have a very closed uh, building form and then have a mechanical ventilation system that you can turn on and off or use as as you see fit. The, the traditional style is to work with um, ventilation occurring naturally through vaulted floors and opening and closing your windows, having a breathable building fabric, so using lime rather than cement in your walls, things like that. Um, Lovely to draw attention to some of those more decorative features, thinking about bell jar shop entrances, that that importance of saving our our retail heritage. Um, we're all very familiar with kind of identical high street, and I think some of that some of that saving of the high street is about the the look and feel of a place that allows build uh, built businesses to pop and flourish, but within the context of the local landscape so maybe choosing whether the the branding of the multinational sort of shouts louder than the the traditional historic fabric of the of the building and certainly traditional shop entrances um they create a very different feel to um what might be modern interventions of those things so follow-up quote there just sash or casement windows um there's a bit of technical language in there, but in common parlance, the division becomes a sort of a sash window usually refers to a sliding sash, which can be single hung if one of the windows moves or double hung if both of the windows move um, or casement windows, which usually refers to um, being side hung or side hinged. So a window that would open outwards. Um, if I go deep into my joinery, that's not technically correct, but I think it's the best thing to, to work with. So casements opening outwards, sashes sliding up and down is probably how most of us would uh, talk about it and look at the buildings around us. Um, the variations uh, that are being brought up there are six and six or eight and eight, um, and that refers to the number of smaller panes um, that each of the windows is made up of. So that would be six small panes above six small panes uh, or eight in the case of the other example given. Those numbers aren't necessarily the same. Um, certainly in later windows you got two over one um, and in windows that are quite tall in their rectangular form um, having a higher number of panes on the top is, is quite common to see. Um, and of course that was from a practical point of view as well. Glass was very hard to produce in large panes, so in many ways the style of sash window design having having more panes actually made more economic sense because the glazing was very expensive uh, part of the process and the bigger the panes went uh, the more expensive that might be. So 
the next, uh, the final quote I just brought up there is something that kind of shifts away from uh, a repetitive classical style, and it's an odd thing to see on uh, that elevation of buildings, but I have no proof of this, but I'd speculate and I'd be interested if anyone local knows that that potentially um, having an OG form, uh, so a style of arch um, on the dovecut window that's visible on that elevation, that might be present in farm buildings in the area. It might reference uh, something from a church nearby. It's interesting to draw upon that. Um, and especially for me, if you're particularly eagle-eyed, the image on the right is a picture from our workshop in Cumbria, um, which is a grade two listed coach house that we're um, luckily repurposing as both a woodworking workshop for myself and a stained glass conservation workshop for my partner. Um, but in the shadow of a um, more classically designed house, the coach house has these embellish embellishments of the sort of window surround on the inside. And if you can see internally the sort of uh, glazing bars at the top of the windows um, have a have an OG design built into them. Um, and as much as this is a pattern that you would see on classical buildings, um, in the classical form it would be very strongly symmetrical, it would be drawn by geometrical means, both sides would match each other um, and it would really follow a pattern. Um, now it's obviously not the best image in the little green box but um, from what I can see from it there it looks like quite a tall OG. We've got the opposite going on in ours which is it's a very flat <laughs> OG so both of those are indicative of um, maybe somebody having a bit more of a go at uh, classical design and certainly in our example you can see that the two sides of the OG don't even match each other which would be sacrificed to a classicist but is is quite a fun form to see in um, in a more vernacular build so interesting to see those things and just another tangent to <laughs> take you away on there so into the into the kind of bulk of the talk looking at how we look after uh, timber and buildings um, I've got the three words at the top and I'll just draw some attention to each of them on these slides. So um, in some ways they can be seen as different things, um, but I think more and more people are trying to trying to take a kind of whole building approach and try and understand um, that these different words are appropriate um, for for buildings at different times. So taking a lot of um, guidance from English Heritage here who produce some really excellent um, material that can can help homeowners, architects, anyone interested in conservation. Quite a lot of it's free um, and available to download by PDF. Some of that's available printed as well. Um, so I'm referring to some of it now and at the end of the slide there's a bibliography and a couple of the slides have links as well so if if this is made available I'd, I'd certainly recommend people follow up um, some of those links. Um, so looking at repair as our first word to target that's obviously an intervention um, in the bill in the historic environment or the in historic building structure um, And the first, the first thing we're looking at uh, listed there is the, the routine maintenance. So before we even get to the repair stage, what are we doing just not to let a building degrade? That's the most useful thing we can do for our windows and doors is to give it a light clean. It's to um, keep it, keep debris out of the way. It's to sort of notice that it's aging prematurely before it really becomes a problem. So before we get to that stage of needing to make interventions there's there's things we can do and when the moment comes that we do need to make those interventions we've got to be thinking about how we sustaining the the sort of heritage of um of our buildings and of our individual components of buildings so um 
the interventions there to understand the value of uh, maybe the timber component or the building as a whole. Um, and one of the ways would be to just not not remove historic fabric unnecessarily. Um, but when we do take the the decision to intervene, we're trying to remove maybe the minimum amount of historic fabric and then to really understand which bit is important. So on the Prince Foundation this year, I got involved in a discussion with somebody else who uh, was very determined that resin should never be used in um, timber repairs. Um, so you get a kind of a two part filler that uses resin that sets hard and can be matched to the shape of the timber. And he thought this was sort of sacrilegious because he was very interested and preserving the feels of woodwork and joinery. Um, but my prompt for him was to say, well, what if it's not the craftsmanship that's being uh, conserved, but the actual timber? If what you're working with is a particularly rare example of historic timber, it might be that there's thousands of examples of mortise and tenon joints across the country, but there's maybe only one or two examples of five, six, seven hundred year old um, oak. So that's just giving us the little prompt to say we're, we're thinking about what it is that we're trying to preserve um, and then how are we best going to maintain those heritage values, really understanding what it is we're working with and then choosing how we intervene. So um, I'll actually read this quote in full. Obviously you can read read yourselves, but it'll, it'll draw a bit more attention to some of those things. So an issue, an issue that often arises when devising a programme of repair is whether or where to include an element of restoration and if this can be justified. English Heritage's conservation principles defines restoration as returning a heritage asset to a known earlier state on the basis of compelling evidence without conjecture. The document sets out a number of criteria which, if met, would normally make restoration acceptable. Indeed, the distinction between restoration and repair may well become blurred when architectural details and or decorative elements that are important to the character and appearance of a historic building become eroded or damaged. Understanding these values or elements, particularly evidential and aesthetic values and their relative contribution to overall significance should guide decisions so far as resources permit. So that's we've slightly moved beyond repair to restoration and English heritage are, are pushing that idea of returning it to a known earlier state. So that's an interesting factor of sort of if the sash windows of the high street only appeared in the 1900s but there was previous examples of a a side hung casement window or a mullioned window in a more medieval style and there was good evidence of that and the historic fabric of the sash window had deteriorated to a state that an intervention was required it would be possible to consider changing the look of the building to match a known previous state. So the words there are important on the basis of compelling evidence without conjecture. So they're really looking for some pretty good historical source to say this was like this before. So that could be pictorial evidence, sketch evidence. It could have been written in diaries in different places or it could be in the in the fabric of the building. Um, for timber framers around the country, it's a point of interest as to whether the, we should be preserving black and white timber frames. But this is an affectation of, of the sort of Victorian era, the, the idea of exposing your timber frame and then having a very heavy kind of black bituminous uh, cover of the timber um, as a stark contrast to the white of a, a lime finish and in the infill. So uh, that wouldn't have been traditional. <laughs> in most of those circumstances, it would have been more common to, to have a, a lime render or a clay finish going totally over the surface of that. The timber frame was structural rather than aesthetic um, in lots of cases. So 
there's an argument to be had there about whether whether we might take ourselves back to a an even earlier era in how we restore um, historic fabric. So that's a little bit to consider on that word. And then conservation with thinking about how we can really maintain the fabric that we have. So in every way that we uh, intervene in a building, do we really need to rip off an old wallpaper? Do we really need to update single glazing to be double glazing? Do we ever want to introduce a plastic door to a traditional building? Um, thinking about, yes, we may want to heavily sand floorboards, but actually is there value in uh, the example that we have there? So that's an extreme case to take and it, and it may be that we have softwood floorboards on upper stories across the whole country. So the, the value of them and their importance to the um, historic uh, or the sort of heritage value of the building um, is limited and we might be quite happy with the intervention, but it should certainly prompt the thought in our brain of uh, what's the least we can do and how can we best look after a building that's uh, already got value and has has lasted for hundreds of years. So that second quote is is sort of hinting at that um, beyond just the prompt to think about it is the actual legislative need. So if if the building is listed um, and if it's conservation area, then you actually have a duty of care as an owner um, or in the council as maybe a legal representative to consider um, the preservation from harm. So that's both to its fabric, both making sure that the building doesn't uh, fall into disrepair or that you don't spoil the original look, but also to its significance. So why was it important in the first place? And that that's more obvious in buildings that are things like mills or um, you know, the windmills or the water mills that have an iconic character and, and would have been important to the industrial development of places. Um, but it's also important to consider in, in terms of our retail and residential properties in, in places like West Beach. So thought I'd pop pop this on has just got numbers on the on the top section, how we think about um, going about our interventions. There'd be some some contest to some of this, but number one is almost certainly maintenance when we're trying to do work on uh, keeping an old building in its best state. Not letting it get bad is the best thing we can do. Um, preservation is a good one. There's there's a period of uncertainty when you're making a plan for what you're going to do. Uh, we may decide that you know very full conservation, the restoration that we need to do is actually very costly. Um, and there's a, but there's a need to stop things getting worse. So often preservation can be done in a way that is fully reversible. Um, and we're just looking at temporary ways in which we can make sure that things don't get worse whilst we're making the decisions about how, how we can best intervene. Conservation is there at number three, really keeping as much of the original there as possible, um, not making interventions without good cause um, and where we're making interventions we really need to think about recording the interventions that we make making sure that uh, the the changes are mapped for future generations uh, the next custodians of the building to be able to see what you've done um, and hopefully understand it even if they end up reversing it themselves repairs are more significant change um, and those can still be a very good thing to do so rather than ripping out a sash window that's got a bit mouldy maybe got some rot in the sill would it be possible just to to cut away the rot repair the window sill maybe get a window that doesn't open to reopen again and suddenly the the building user is starting to really benefit not just from the aesthetic um, historic value of having that kind of component in the building, but also the actual use of that 
structure. So having having the window function, having a door that shuts nicely, that kind of repair is important before we get to the big changes. Um, then restoration is there. That's that's more extreme intervention. And it's more likely to come with lots of research and lots of um, real thought as to the era and the historic value that you're trying to represent with the, the building that's protected. So I put those five as as numbers. Um, I think they're a good sort of hint at the way that you think about it. The two at the bottom kept a little bit separate, but um, increasingly sustainability is almost taking precedence over um, historic fabric certainly in the minds of uh, lots of younger people, certainly in people who live in cold houses and have increasing energy bills. Um, we're going to be looking at making interventions that don't take uh, historic character as the first principle, but are really looking to change how sustainable it is to live in these properties. So we have a huge housing stock of, of older properties in the UK and it's going to be an absolute necessity to change them to meet current living standards and current uh, needs. So there's a real question as to how we how we do that um, in both a sustainable way from the environmental perspective, but also sustainable for the historic character. So there's definitely ways of doing that. Um, and that's something we need to consider and also to make the case that the most sustainable thing to do is use the buildings we've already got you know consistently knocking things down and rebuilding using new materials requarrying the brick and stone that already forms the fabric of our building is not a sustainable thing to do so the changes that we can make and should make um, to make these buildings livable without losing historic value is going to be very important there in the reuse of the of the buildings, um, but I'd also consider that reuse of components. So, for a joiner, um, you probably don't want to trust the person that comes in and says, "Rip it all out and start again." Um, you really need, you really want to be listening to the person that says that window's too far gone, but ninety percent of this is savable. Um, we've got ways and means to to splice things in to make changes to to keep what is there there for as long as possible um, but to still make it functional for for the present um, so this section kind of moves on to a couple of practical steps that I'd offer um, I've just got gen you know heading headings there to hint at what we might do um, I'll try and rattle through these quite quickly and maybe people's kind of specific uh, points of interest best might crop up in the question and answers or at the end of the bibliography I'll draw more attention to some of those um, historic England pamphlets on guidance for good things for homeowners and, and things that you might do. Um, yeah start it off really simply gentle cleaning that's the best thing you can do for most things to keep it lasting longer um, it's true for your clothes it's true for your furniture it's true for your building fabric so if we've got ways of uh, clearing leaves, if we've got ways of making sure that rainwater goods are functioning, uh, most cases of rising damp are as simple as a leaky tap or drainage not working properly. Um, when we think about window sills rotting, it's often to do with the lack of maintenance of paint. Um, if you're thinking about internal parts of windows rotting, it can quite often be due to condensation on the window. Um, I'm still using the old school method of getting a, a towel or a cloth and wiping it down. My parents have updated to a rather fancy looking uh, sort of window vacuum cleaner that's given them a, a quick skim to reduce condensation on the windows. It's a brilliant thing to do. It's very easy. Uh, it's going to it's going to stop that rot happening before it becomes a major issue and then it allows us to do the next simple thing which is, is keep paint up to date uh, if you can see flakes in paint if you can see a lot of uh, edges sort of tearing up the sooner you can sand that back and give it a little recoat the less of a problem it's going to be so it it reduces the scale of the intervention that we need to make 
um, moving parts if we've got things like windows and doors that are actually in constant use door handles one of those things that we touch all the time and if if we've got historic examples of door handles i mean what a wonderful thing to have as you move through a property it gives you a different feel and a, and a literal feel you know every time you open the door you're touching something from history and if we can keep those things moving rather than thinking ah oh, there's the rattly old knob that doesn't quite work every time you get to appreciate the sort of the craftsmanship that's gone into it um, and the feel of an item that's that's been touched and worn over time so thinking about um, dry graphite powder in hinges um, or in moving parts that's a that's a good alternative to oil if oil was something that would clog up with dust um, but certain things can just take just a little drop of oil a little spray of wd-40 or other uh, lubricants are available that kind of stuff can just uh, just stave off um, problems occurring if you are doing that kind of thing near to um, unfinished timber you maybe want a bit of paper before you spray or before you touch something in so that you're not you're not sort of doing any damage to the adjacent uh, building fabric. Intervention that's happening all the time now is draft proofing. So um, this is kind of super practical measure if you're a homeowner of thinking about getting heavier weight curtains or using those little furry snakes and stuff at the bottom of your door, but also building it into the fabric. Um, different types of seals that can go around the, the rebates of doors and windows. Um, anywhere that where it joins or you're starting to feel a draft, it's worth considering um, doing some research, looking into things that you could intervene on and, and maybe that's a fir first port of call for um, getting in professional help. Um, just at the bottom there, a couple of interventions for sustainability. So obviously in new builds, there's a huge push for double glazing, triple glazing. Um, units that has its place um it's obviously very effective at reducing the um insulation lost through glazing but it's a big change to a historic um component so you want to think very carefully about uh going down the line of double glazing in historic sash windows for example so a lot of the aesthetic value of those uh, windows is how thin the glazing beads are and when you go up to a double glazing unit you're talking about a, a minimum size of of 12 mil and that has a questionable history of companies that can keep running uh, but really looking to go up to sort of 20 mil 24 mil and that that changes the scale of the glazing bar that you can use the rebate that it needs to go into and that's visible from from outside and inside. So you gain something in insulation, but you might really lose something in historic value. Um, but they do work. So if you've got a, a, a whole intervention taking place, if an entire window is being replaced, it may well be worth considering that, that line of thought. Um, secondary glazing is a different thing. That's about stepping away from the historic fabric and really trying to create another line at which um, glazing can be installed, the whole unit can be new, but it needs to be subtly done because if it's very obviously a second level of glazing from either inside or out, it's quite likely to change the aesthetic value of um, the kind of fenestration area, so the windows and doors that you have. So if you are going to do that, it's something that wants to be considered really quite well, um, hopefully working with someone who's done it before and you can see the examples of their work that haven't changed the historic fabric too greatly so nice one for me shows everyone's not perfect I took these pictures in uh, in my house last week uh, this is the property that we rent um, you can see the sort of maintenance examples we're enjoying the the fact that spring has ever so slightly sprung and we've got some <laughs> got some sunshine coming through um, but coming with that are the cold mornings and condensation on the window um, the cold pane of glass that's a single glazed sash window um, so that's a picture before giving it a quick wipe um, that's a wipe of the glass but also a wipe of the area underneath it you can see some of that area where the moisture is built up a little bit too much um, 
had started to lose its paint structure and also starting to pick up little bits of uh, little bits of mold at the level in that picture it's just you know if you can get get that sort of maintenance schedule once a week quick wipe down uh, very light sprays wouldn't wouldn't use heavy mildew removers or anything like that it probably doesn't need it bit of a wipe down if it needs a bigger intervention would be paint um, the third image is the thing we come to all the time people making bad interventions uh, the plugs and wires you can see at the bottom are our broad broadband and uh, in the first stage somebody's decided to just drill through the actual casement so as much as that window has been painted shut and isn't usable uh, it'd still be much more favorable to seek another route for this wire so um, in this building in particular it could very easily have gone underneath the sill uh, without a great deal of extra work um, and they simply haven't done that so that's just an example of the workmanship and and sort of keeping an eye on these things and, and trying to just step back and say could we do a better job for the building than drill a hole through it um, the middle picture is one of the windows in our property that has been replaced uh, it was done before before we got there but it's actually a very nice example of a new uh, double hung sash window it's got brush strips in between the sashes it's got a uh, surround uh, for the sash cord so that it doesn't get painted over it's a relatively thin double glazed unit so it's the windows are broadly in keeping with um, the example the two windows here are actually next to each other one was replaced one wasn't um, and if you are making an intervention that's that's a nice example of what a modern a modern wood sash window might do for you so those are some of uh, some of the options. Draft proofing is something that that people might be able to do themselves. Um, the research is there showing how much of a difference it makes, and it can be quite a low, a low cost and a very reversible intervention. So even if you do decide to go down a, a bigger repair or restoration thought further into the future, um, this is something that we can do to just make your house more comfortable to live in. Um, so looking at the two types of seals that are most common there um one is where you'd say close the door against it and the the pressure of the door shutting would sort of compress the seal um, and the other the wiper seal is more of a brush type uh, finish and that would be more common in kind of sliding parts so things that things that need to run all the time little picture of somebody uh, applying that by hand to a window that's out um, but obviously it would be nice to do that in a situation where you, you don't need to take it out entirely but if it's being repainted if it's being taken out anyway it's certainly worth considering um, and a picture borrowed from one of the historic england documents just showing some of the some of the different types of seal profiles and then the build-up of a kind of a good intervention where you're seeing the three points of traditional air leakage are now all replaced with uh, draft proofing seals which is going to substantially reduce the, the feel of cool in the room and the overall heat loss from the space so uh, think about repair on windows and doors and drawing attention to to that top point of something that's gone so badly it can can no longer function properly so could we bring it back uh, into functioning as it's intended and then can we repair a small part of it to get the overall component to really work so that's that's something that we look at next um, if we are going down that line really important to consider how we record things so you're we're all part of history now um, we don't always think it but in 10 years time 20 years time just after you've done the repair is often the time that you think gosh I really wish I knew what this looked like just before so modern smartphones photographs measurements uh, recordings are all really important but also consider just you know bagging up a small part of it writing on a label that's a very conservation uh, conservation thing to do um, 
you get some very extreme examples where people bag up little little bits of dust and things like that, just as part of the record of history. I wouldn't say you need to do that every time you brush your windows down, but uh, it's worth considering what might be important to, to future generations. Um, and paint's a good example of that. Even if we're painting a whole window all over again, maybe it's worth leaving 10% of it with all the layers of history um, and just letting that be there as a little record for for people who might be interested. We certainly uh, are looking for those things in. Um, when we look at windows and doors before we make changes to them, and it's perfectly sensible that the future uh, <laughs> will want the same kind of uh, same kind of evidence left for them. Um, a little line in red there is just very obviously historic paint is mostly lead based. Um, so you want to be very careful about wearing masks, not building up dust and and using professionals if you're in any doubt at all. Um, you make the assumption that that lead is in there. A couple of pictures of just sash window repairs. We're seeing a, a replaced sill that's rotted, um, but obviously it's just the external part, not not making an intervention further into the window than is required. And again, on the on the upright sections, it's a splice joint. It's cut on the angle so that if water was to get in there, to if the glue fails, if the water was to get in, there's a chance for it to to run off and and escape um, escape the window. Uh, and no more is being taken out than is required. You can see slightly above the slice splice. It's still not a perfect bit of timber, but we don't need to take everything away. It's going to be filled. It's going to be repainted, and that will get a lot of years of function without losing the whole historic item. Um, and one of the reasons that we don't want to lose too much is the quality of timber that was used in the past was very, very good. Um, so it's timber is very expensive. Uh, we haven't grown quite enough of the trees, certainly at the replacement rate in this country that um, would be required. And many of the trees that were cut down and used in uh, the 18th, 19th century were were very high quality deal pine. So looking at that uh, piece there, we're seeing very tight growth rings. It's going to add a lot more stability to that quality of softwood. If that were to be an equivalent piece now, you'd maybe be seeing the, the growth rings double or three times the size, which adds a lot more potential for, for movement and uh, and kind of vulnerability to, to rot if, if water does get in. Borrowed a couple of pictures of just uh, one of the great joinery books. Uh, it's called Modern Practical Building, but it's from the 20s. So uh, he's a big, big fan of electric uh, power for your machines, but really thinks that you should still use gas lighting in your workshop for uh, for best best building practice. But those are just hinting at some of the the more classical elements that will creep into uh, very high value buildings and. And then just nice to see an annotated diagram of a of a door as well, drawing attention to some of the stranger language that's used, gun stock styles, mountains, uh, stub tenons. You know, it's it's lovely to have that that language that really tracks back through history quite a long time for um for how these things have been built. And then we're probably getting close. Uh, to me overrunning, so I'd love to open it up to question and answers. I'll just flick through a couple of pictures from my kind of portfolio. Um, this was a church door. The intervention change there was uh, a bad sort of plastic wood fill. Um, it's quite interesting on the finished piece that's been uh, refinished with an oil, but the intervention was that the fully plastic uh, Fill material came out, got raked out, but and was replaced with timber. But the choice was made not to colour the timber to look the same as the historic item. So um, it's still quite stark, but it's replacing a, a bad material for a good one. Um, this is our workshop door. Uh, this is the state we came to it in. It had an intervention where the bottom rail had uh, rotted away. So just the bottom rail and uh, some of the mouldings around the bottom were replaced as was some of the door jam 
Um, that was done before we got here, but it's a reasonable intervention of bits of the door that might have might have lost functionality. Um, we added a couple of coats of paint to it, and then uh, a friend of ours who's a sign writer has, has very kindly come and hand painted on the, the Helbeck Stables label, so nice to see that. And then just a few pictures from, from my work with the Prince's Foundation. Um, this is one of Prince Charles's charities involved in uh, teaching craft skills to a new generation of people and very fortunate to take on people who've already got trade skills. So they've maybe been jobbing joiners, blacksmiths, stonemasons, but they're looking for a route into improving their skills and knowledge and also a way into uh, conservation and heritage building. Um, and the examples in these pictures are live built. So it's something that takes place at Dumfries House in Scotland. Um, and from week zero and a sort of foundation base uh, building is put up in about 12 weeks. So um, the yeah, there's a few different examples here, but um, it's it's a hard process and people learn an awful lot on it, but uh, it, it also stands you in very good stead uh, for taking on big projects in the future and, and working in those teams. So this was one from a couple of years ago, taking a very traditional style of, of crook framing. Um, and this, prop, this cot stone cottage was already on the estate and the decision was made to give the students this uh, crook frame to build and it was dropped into the, the kind of original footprint of the of the stone cottage um, and then a new new roof added to kind of modern building specs with high level of insulation. It's pretty cold up in Ayrshire so you're, you're grateful to uh, have a bit of warmth. And then this was last year's uh, just an example on the left of uh, some of the traditional timber frame methods, the, the pegged joints used, no glue in this and, and using green oak, so timber that's been recently felled and still prone to shrinkage and cracking, but building in such a way that as it ages, it gets stronger. Um, sort of traditional wood shingle roof there as an example. Too. And then the same principles applying to something more modern, uh, a project I did with, with Johnny Briggs uh, timber structures um lovely couple in County Durham who who wanted a uh, a play fort for their kids or as they later admitted to us a nice place to have gin and tonics of an evening uh, and this is all built using traditional methods so the same as we've just seen pegged mortise and tenon joints uh, a staircase that doesn't have glues or screws and uh, I'm really trying to use some of these methods to deliver something that um you know, meets people's modern needs, but but keeps these skills alive. So that's all the portfolio stuff. Um, the rest of the slideshow is broadly um, broadly links and uh, bibliography. I'll flick through it now, but it's something that will probably be more use to people um, if this can be released in some form. Um, Probably the only one that I haven't gone into mentioning is is the SBAB uh, and their encouragement for people to do maintenance uh, using a home maintenance calendar. And uh, that's a brilliant thing to have as a homeowner. It's got each of the months of the year. It's got two or three things you need to do. It's a brilliant thing to have a look at as well as their helpline that can help people out. So historic England's listed owners property SPAB and I've given a few of those uh, as a bibliography but but hopefully the links are in there that if people were interested uh, they'd be able to take advantage of that so I'll stop there and hopefully we can do question and answers and uh, uh, if anyone's got anything they to ask I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Owen. That's uh, really, really informative and really interesting to, to see all those uh, the different examples and, and really practical as well. So thanks so much for that. 
Um, we've got, uh, oh, firstly, we've just got a few um, uh, statements from uh, Richard and Steve. Um, one saying that the OG window window you were talking about was um, actually restored by the Wisbeach Society. I think the little stone OG Fantastic. one. Fantastic, yep. Yeah. Um, and apparently there is another um, another OG window in the Flint House in Lynn Road, which is possibly 19th century. So there's there's one more hidden example out there. Very interesting, is, uh, yeah. There'll definitely be ones that will be sought out when we come down to have a look. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, Hugh had a question. He said, are there any best practices or templates on documenting the interventions made and the reasons, rationale, before and after, and making these accessible, including technological situations in multiple locations, including close to the intervention locations, so that owners, custodians and heritage organisation can access these? There is a brilliant checklist on the... Uh, English Heritage website. Uh, it's for homeowners or people making an intervention and it's a very printable document, really usable, and it just says do the best you can, follow this checklist, try and record what's there. If you if you do that, you're leaving a really great historic uh, document for the future and if you happen to make a terrible intervention, somebody can def definitely undo what you've done. But if one starts there, it really helps. Um, it helps the process. So. See, if that isn't specifically linked to, I'll I'll try and dredge up what that link is and uh, and add it to the presentation that gets shared, something like that. Yeah, we're going to put this on YouTube, so I'll try and put the links in in the comment as well. Um, I can see someone else is typing, but I can't see the who they are. So uh, until that pops up, unless whoever's typing would prefer to um, put their um, hand up. Oh um oh how okay um. This is a question that I don't know if you'll be able to answer because I don't know if there is an answer for this yet. But um, how do you ensure that this uh, that the record that people make of interventions is visible in sort of say two hundred years time? Yeah, well, that's that slightly depends on um, how how you do your record keeping. Um, if you if you're working with a listed building, there's a bit of a compulsion for you to. Um, kind of supply your records and, and send them off in such a way but at its simplest it's the same as as creating any record if you know people people made diaries people drew sketches and uh, and if enough people do it enough of that record will will be kept um, for the future so certainly handing things back to historical societies or people who are interested in the types of buildings that you're in the Georgian group or the Victorian group, the vernacular architecture group, they're all very interested in in holding those records. So if you can fill them out, make a copy, keep one yourself, maybe your record keeping will end up better than theirs. And um, we never know for sure, but the more people that do it, the more likely it is that a, a good record will be made for the future. So I'd certainly go about doing it rather than be feel defeated before we start. Yeah, I think in America as well, it's quite common to have what's called a house Bible, which is sort of a, a bit like for your sort of your car record, maintenance record, and then you pass that on to whoever buys the house after you. I think that's less common here, but I think it happens. Fantastic thing to start. Yeah, if you uh, if you ever have a leak without knowing where the stock cock is, you suddenly wonder why every previous owner hasn't left you with that knowledge. So, yeah, it's a good thing to begin. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and Rich Barwell asks, why is conservation so expensive? I own two listed buildings, 15th and 16th century in North Hans, and scared of consulting anyone. Yeah, why is it so expensive? Um, I mean, there's been a long period of not having enough people with the skills. Um, we probably don't have enough people doing even general trades, new building in this country. We've certainly uh, lost some of that with with lost migration in the last while, but the efforts being made, certainly the, the Prince Foundation English Heritage have started their own apprenticeship scheme. The National Trust is doing the same. There's a real effort to to train people into being able to work on conservation uh, buildings. Even once we've got the skills, it's more expensive because it's slower. I mean, <laughs> the number of uh, points I've made just to say the things that you'd like to consider and think about before you even start that slows us down the thinking time um, you don't quite know how bad things are until you start peeling back layers so that's one of the reasons for not doing it um, but once you do start 
trying to make interventions in a building, you're going to expose things that really need to be protected. Um, but it's fantastic that that someone like Richard owns um, listed buildings and things that are four or five hundred years old. That's an incredible privilege. And and hopefully the cost that you're spending to conserve them now is going to last the next four or five hundred years. And that's that's where the cost starts to feel uh, not less significant for you now, but it's certainly it's you making a real contribution to the to the historic fabric of the country. And yeah, maybe that maybe that makes the extra zero on the end of something feel a, a bit more acceptable. Um, but it is expensive. I think that's I wouldn't wouldn't pretend that it isn't. Um, but hopefully it means that the interventions you're making and the people that you're uh, getting to do work with you are are doing the best job for the building. Um, yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's that idea of a, a sort of quality of work and letting that letting that last. And again, the point of conservation is to to keep things to keep things standing or to keep things working. Um, uh, and I think uh, Rich makes a point as well about uh, lots of different experts have a different solution and how how you how do you sort of know that one solution is either correct or, or better? Yeah, really difficult. Um, tr try and pick the best experts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think possibly the best expert we can use is the examples that have definitely stood the test of time. Um, there's always a new generation, there's always a new product, there's always a new thing that appears on the market. But if you've been, if you're an owner of a 15th century property and there's interventions that were made in the 17th century that are still going now, they're pretty good interventions. So if you really look at your, your windows, say, and they've already got splice joints and they've had pegged mortises and tenons repaired or one window pane's been removed without damaging any of the rest of them and they're still here now from a few hundred years ago they're a really good method so that's where the sort of the expertise of the past is still visible if if we look for it um in terms of those bigger interventions of uh secondary glazing or full replacements it's uh it's probably those old tactics of word or mouth, long-standing reputations, uh, really taking people who've who've either done a lot of time and and have buildings that they can show you and interventions that they can show you, or or trying to trust that this this new breed of people really care about old buildings and have gone to the effort of of picking up more skills and pr probably people who don't say I have all the answers, but this is the best possible way we can can move forward um and the answer at the end of you know all those links is spab have got a free helpline english heritage have got a free helpline if people are charging you a lot of money to consult before you've even started um you're probably making mistakes so try try and use those uh, lottery funded sort of slightly government supported bodies first because it's not in their interest to lie about it. They're the they're the institutions that are kind of tasked with looking after the heritage. So hopefully it will um hopefully they'll be able to give you the the fairest kind of answers to what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And again, those the resources that um the owner said in the end of his um presentation are, are really useful. There's a there's a lot of uh, information available online uh which has a, a technical question so we'll finish we'll finish with that and then um and yeah well yeah we'll have that one last question so um which said why don't people take sash windows out from the inside to maintain rather than pay a fortune for scaffolding uh yeah that's a really interesting one <laughs> um as by preference that is definitely what you do um it's actually a law in scotland um if you if you're above a third third story window, your sashes have to be uh, removable to the inside or even hinged so that they can be cleaned and maintained. Um, that that should have been brought in everywhere. Um, the answer is sort of some of them are too hard to get at. If you need to, if you need 
to open up a window, um, you probably need to cut the, the if they've been painted shut, say you need to make incisions from both sides. Um, if you're just making a repair to the sill, but the bottom sash is, is shut, then you kind of need to get at it from all angles. And that that's just, I mean, it's a killer when you have to make those scaffolds uh, payments for the sake of small interventions. So um, those are big costs. And I would probably say if, if you're thinking those uh, if something like a scaffold needs to be done, then you actually need to step back from your property and and really look at um, surveying everything all at once. You know, once you're going two stories up, you might as well go three stories up, check the gutter, check the bottom row of tiles. If you live on a terrace, talk with your neighbours because getting one scaffold up, getting everyone's looked at, those are some of the ways of sort of sharing costs a little bit. And it it adds a slight administrative burden but it might it might make things um it might make things work better brilliant um yeah thank you so much i think we're gonna have to um stop there because we've uh, run over a little bit but thank you so much for uh, such an informative talk um and it was great to see some examples from Wisbeach as well as well as um as well as more genuine uh, more general as well um, so yeah, again, everyone, this will be available on YouTube and uh, I think Owen put his contact details at um, the end of his presentation as well. Um, so if you'd like to get in contact for uh, either more um, advice or work or anything like that, then please, please do. Um, and thank you all for joining again and look out for the next one, which will be advertised soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye.